Hello, everyone. Welcome to another PLUS seminar. Uh, it's on the, a critical reflection of protectionism in relation to the 20, 30 by 30 global biodiversity framework and whether this is a great conservation tragedy. The seminar today is presented by Professor Bram Busha. Just a short introduction to Bram. Bram is a professor and chair of the Sociology of Development and Change Group at Wageningen University and visiting professor at the University of Johannesburg. Bram's research investigates changing human nature relations and environmental development interactions in and beyond the context of late capitalism. Uh, of late has authored three uh, books, which I'll mention. One is The Truth About Nature, the other one is environmentalism in the era of post-truth politics and platform capitalism, uh, <clears throat> published by Invest of uh, California Press 2021. And he's co-author with Robert Fleischer of uh, the famous book, The Conservation Revolution, uh, radical, uh, radical Ideas for Saving Nature Beyond the Anthropocene by Vessel 2020. Uh, Bram is also one of the senior editors for Conservation and Society. So Bram, you have got certain minutes presentation and thereafter we will have a question and the answer. Bram, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Mafa. And um, thank you to everybody for, for joining. It's really wonderful to see many old and new friends uh, and also Bridget, Ian, Ruth, others. It's, a, it's an honor, uh, Andres, uh, that all of you are are online. Um, so this this uh, this paper is really thinking in progress to help myself, many others. I think hopefully in the in the project that we are working on with uh, with PLAS, the the Living Landscapes project, uh, led by Muniza, Muniba Isaacs, um, to yeah see the context within which. Um, yeah, we do sort of more critical conservation work, and um, yeah, how to how to frame sort of recent developments in terms of the the thirty by thirty global biodiversity framework. Um, I think many of you will know that last year, uh, end of twenty twenty two, the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework was uh, was concluded uh, under the the Convention on Biological Diversity. And um, yeah, this this was after a long delay due to COVID, and then finally a global new agreement around biodiversity to tackle the extinction crisis was uh, was concluded last year. It was uh, seen as a historic deal, a Paris moment for nature, real paradigm change, um, etc. The the kind of jubilant rhetoric that that we know that comes after most of these uh, most of these big meetings. Um, it centers on it's not exclusively only, but but one of the most important outcomes of this uh, global biodiversity framework is the so-called thirty by thirty uh, goal, uh, creating of, of putting thirty percent of the planet un, under some form of protection by uh, twenty thirty. Uh, at the same time, also there's much emphasis on indigenous peoples and inclusion. So. Um, all of it together made uh, United Nations Environment Program Inger uh, Andersen um, say that uh, with this pact in nature, all we have to do is, you know, implement uh, implement it so that we can all truly make peace with nature. Now, obviously, um, I'm not going to go into this uh, this rhetoric, but the question how historical paradigm changing this treaty really is is important. Um, there is perhaps more intention to to indigenous peoples, but at the same time, the the treaty is very much what I call yeah BAU business as usual, um, particularly because some of the uh, main uh, is issues uh, elements like uh, increase of protected areas, but also neoliberal um, conservation paradigms are of course you know have been around for very long, right? So, so much of it is paradigm reinforcing rather than uh, paradigm changing, right? And it fits in a long history of particularly protectionist type of conservation, which has a long history right up to the start of, of, of conservation, modern conservation itself. Um, and this is important because 
the rise and, 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 and the idea of protectionism and particularly the rise of protection, uh, protected areas have not been able to hold the uh, extinction crisis. I always like to show these, these, these two slides with on the one hand, the rise of protected areas and uh, below the rise of the extinction crisis. And you can see both going up hand in hand. Um, so the best thing that maybe conservationists can say is that it maybe would have been even worse had it not been for protected areas, but it, it hasn't stopped the, the crisis um, from basically spiraling out of control right now. So um, the question, of course, is why would this particular global biodiversity framework succeed? Why should we expect different outcomes when failing forward, as my colleague Rob Fletcher calls it, is, is the norm for these kind of tre treaties? Now, my assumption is that we should not expect this to succeed, but that we should still explain the likelihood of failure and why this is the case. Um, my focus in this paper is particularly on why neoprotectionist IDs and protected areas continue to be so central to global policy, despite so much critique of them and the failure to reach overall goals. So that for me is a really sort of central yeah, problem conundrum that I want to address. And my argument in the paper is that an overlooked element in critiques of protectionism, of global protected areas, is actually protectionism rootedness in biological field research and the institutional value and power this carries in conservation circles, leading to what I call a love-failure dialectic, which is part of the broader sort of great conservation tragedy that conservation keeps on pushing harder and harder amidst a a broader and, and widening, deepening biodiversity crisis. So that, that is the main argument I want to present in the next uh, uh, 25 minutes. And I very much look forward to, to the discussion. Um, I will do so by first giving a brief history of protectionism, near protectionism and its critiques, and then go a little bit into uh, the importance of uh, field research and sort of the direct connection to nature in that and then, yeah, how that leads to this uh, love failure dialectics and some some problems with all this that I'm still sort of thinking through. And I love your, I would love your input on. Um, if you look at the history of a neo protectionism, in particular, so this is a literature in particular or discourse in global conservation that really pushes back against community based conservation. It wants to sort of go back to the the roots of yeah, protectionist conservation around protected areas, it has come in basically two waves. The first at the late, late 1990s, early 2000s, and the second one from 2013 to about 2018 and, and onwards. Now, of course, neo-protectionism uh, means it has a prequel, so itself is it's, it's a sequel, uh, you know, of protectionism, which was the dominant term in modern early conservation, late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, for example, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, that many of you um, will know, started its institutional life, of course, as the International Union for the Protection of Nature. Now, this changed in um, 1956, particularly because, you know, proponents argued that the term conservation actually enabled them to enroll much more powerful economic and political actors into the fold, whereas protection hindered such ambitions due to its uh, restrictive impression. So this was also really to get more powerful actors uh, and not, not just local people um, or indigenous peoples, etc. cetera. Um, so it had this double connotation. It has, a, uh, at the same time, it had had a double connotation from the start. Meaning what I want to say with that is that protection was sort of like, a, it has a common sense connotation um, in that you want to protect something that, that that you care about, and I will come back to that. But it also started increasingly getting this restrictive impression, this restrictive connotation, and that's why ultimately it was sort of dumped in favor of uh, the term conservation. Now, um, there's a, lo a huge history uh, around this that I, I uh, obviously can't uh, get into here, but one of the key elements obviously that are sort of framings, I would say that this needs to be uh, viewed in or in relation to 
is the broader discussions around preservationism versus conservation, right? Whereby the former connoted once more with strict wilderness protection and conservation increasingly started connoting with sustainable use of natural resources. And as I said, and as, as Raf de Bond shows in his wonderful book, uh, Nature's uh, Diplomats, protectionism was in the 50s, 60s, quite effectively erased. I mean, it, it, still, it was still used in this common sense term, but conservation was the preferred uh, term because it allowed for this enrollment of diverse interests, actors and IDs. Now, one of the key sort of enrollment that happened uh, and broadening was, and again, this is a very much more complex story, but of course the community-based sort of um, you know, enrollment of local communities, uh, poor people around protected areas, indigenous peoples from the 1970 onwards, or what some have called the social turn in international uh, conservation. Uh, a lot has been written about that that I won't go into, but that is basically what the first wave of neo-protectionism uh, responded to in the 1990s. So we're making <laughs> quite a, a big jump here. Um, the key argument being that you know we've seen this massive expansion of the term conservation to get different kind of um, um, interest enrolled, particularly also by including development, conservation and communities, et cetera. And that is what this first wave really responded to. Now this first wave um, has a broader literature, but really comes down to these four books, uh, Making Parks Work, uh, by John de Borg et al., John de Borg's own Requiem for Nature, John Oates' Myth and Reality in the Rainforest, and the book Parks in, in Peril, the so two edited volumes and two uh, uh, single authored uh, work. Broadening of the, this idea of conservation. Right? So there are some of the key arguments in this book uh, as... Um, uh, analyzed by Peter Wilshus and uh, Flora Lou Holt and others are, for example, that it, this, this broader sort of decades movement away from nature protection is due to unseen scientific romantic postmodernism, kind of language they used. They argue that people oriented conservation approaches are failing, uh, failing miserably. They are expensive, but not effective in protecting biodiversity. And so we must go back to parks as the last safe havens for tropical ecosystems, really focus on the defense of protected areas because biodiversity protection is a moral imperative um, going forward to save nature in its, in its own right. So these were some of the key arguments in, in this broader literature. And it was accompanied by quite a strong rhetoric so, for example, Te Borg and, and Van Schaik in one of these books argue that uh, no apology should be required for adhering to the accepted definition of a national park as a haven for nature where people, except visitors, staff and concessionaires, are excluded. To advocate anything else for developing countries simply because they are poor, one hopes a temporary condition, is to advocate a double standard, something we find uh, deplorable. Now, this led to major critiques of this of this first wave. Uh, for example, by this first paper that really sort of put this idea of new protectionism on the agenda by Will Schusen et al. in 2002, arguing that the reasoning is incomplete, not necessarily because of factual oversights, but as a result of uh, significant blind spots that overlook the deeply politicized nature uh, of nature protection. Flora Lou Holt had a very important uh, intervention into this debate around the concept of uh, what, she, what she termed conservation catch-22, whereby she stated that this kind of protectionist rhetoric sees, you know, conditions under which people are ecologically friendly, you know, under this viewpoint, as the same conditions under which we should not expect conservation to develop. To develop. But when people are faced with a situation that may promote resource stewardship, such as increased population pressure or resource exploitation for markets, under the protectionist viewpoint, they then are perceived as obstacles to conservation. So, um, in, in short, basically what she's saying is that as long as people remain primitive, quote unquote primitive, right, they are sort of natural conservationists, but when they start to develop, right, they can no longer be conservationists. And, and she uh, she referred to, uh, refers to this as a conservation 
Catch-22. Um, others, like James Mudumbedzi and, and, and particularly um, many colleagues in, uh, in Southern Africa, including Webster Wonder, uh, Frank Matose, Masejo Matsamuz, and others, contributed uh, to, to these debates um, as well. But if you look back at these debates, and that this is when I sort of st stepped into my own research around these issues, the point was not necessarily against protection per se, but rather about how it is done and who is in the lead or in control. And I will come back to, to, to this point. Now, these debates lingered on until about 2010. They came to a head, I would say, at the, the, the World Parks Congress in 2003 in South Africa uh, again, uh, but lingered on and sort of quieted down a little bit as conservationists started to you know, go about their, their business again until about 2011, 2012, when we saw the start of a, a second wave of, of neo-protectionism. Um, so again, and I've, I've said this a couple of times, this, this is a big picture kind of historical uh, move. Many details I'm leaving out. Uh, if people are interested, we can, we can talk about that. Um, but as these debates sort of quieted down a little bit, um, uh, a new conservation literature uh, came up around what they themselves call new conservation, uh, including by, by this guy, Peter Kariva, but also these books that you see here by uh, Emma Morris, Brett Pierce, and others, um, that again started critiquing uh, mainstream conservation. And they made some very serious arguments that sort of also respond to some of the things I, I mentioned earlier uh, at the start of my presentation, namely that the global protected area estate will not, does not stop biodiversity loss. Also that conservation has been working against the poor and must actually take development seriously. It, it must drop its unrealistic myths of wilderness and pristine nature. These do not exist in the Anthropocene, which was the term that sort of really pushed these, these debates. So humans must take their dominance seriously and start managing the earth as a garden and cultivate what uh, Fred Pierce calls the new wild. Um, so they they propose to do this um, really sort of within within the current sort of capitalist uh, framework, and we're quite explicit about that, right? So many of them, not all, but many new 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 conservationists, were very much in favor of uh, of natural capital approaches uh, to conservation as well. So this triggered the what I call the second wave of neo protectionist responses, right? really against this Anthropocene new conservation ideas and against the arguments I just presented. So their points were quite diametrically the opposite, namely wilderness and nature are real, need to be as autonomous from humans as possible. We shouldn't embrace this Anthropocene era, rather we need to rein in its excesses and protection of the wild in that should be paramount. We should do that particularly through protected areas, but also through a focus on limiting human population growth and interestingly uh, through uh, limiting consumption and economic growth. Um, so elsewhere we, uh, myself and Rob Fletcher uh, and, and of course my colleagues in South Africa go into some of these issues in relation to our convivial conservation paradigm more, more broadly. But for me here, the key thing is that again, this sort of response to this broadening of, of conservation away from protectionism led to this, this sort of wave of coming back to neo-protectionist proposals. And the same themes then emerge, right? Only within parks and protected areas will many large animals critical to ecological processes persist. And so the global strategy must be to expand the number and size of protected areas, interconnect and rewild them literally up to half the entire planet, according to uh, E.O. Wilson, this idea of half Earth, uh, which he sort of translated into, you know, which was later translated by this half uh, nature needs half uh, network as the goal of 50 by 50, 50% uh, 50 of the Earth under some form of protection by 2050. And so you can see that the 30 by 30 goal in the global uh, biodiversity framework that was concluded last year is basically sort of an intermediate step uh, towards uh, 50 by 50. So this is at least where I also argue this idea of 30 by 30 sort of really, really comes from 
uh, as part of these broader discussions around uh, protectionism and neo-protectionism. Now, since this happened about a decade ago, there have been uh, uh, interesting recent developments leading up precisely to the Kongming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. And one of the most interesting issues that happened is sort of a convergence of neo-protectionism and other approaches like the three global conditions framework by Locke et al, the global goal for nature that you can find on naturepositive.org that by 2050, um, we should have a full biodiversity recovery as you can see in this, um, in this graph. Um, and a lot of that thinking found itself uh, in the, uh, uh, the uh, Kungming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework that was concluded last year. So this is a bit of a whirlwind overview of, of, of neo-protectionism, uh, the, uh, the second wave, uh, the first and second wave. And the second saw, again, staunch critiques of this kind of reasoning. So some of the main critiques were, for example, that it ignores powerful engines of resource extraction and consumption that are actually the main drivers of biodiversity loss globally. If you would implement, say, half Earth, it would have significant negative social impacts. Uh, Slicher et al. in their paper calculated you, you would have to displace over a billion people. Um, again, the question, who controls protected areas? Who creates them? Who dictates what uh, could be done there? It ignores decades of thinking about building relationships between protected areas and human societies. And it doesn't have a, uh, an agenda for biodiversity in the human half of Earth. Right? If you focus so much on saving half of the planet for biodiversity, what happens to that to the other half? Uh, most importantly, I think over the last uh, last decade, um, the central issue that was also already in the critiques in relation to the first wave of neoprotectionism that it doesn't take indigenous peoples um, uh, and local other ways of relating to nature seriously was now taken up uh, and, and taken to the to the next level. It's sort of conjoined with a broader decolonizing conservation uh, wave that is still very much going on that pointed at important issues around race, gender, class, um, and the relations between the global north and the global south in relation to conservation. So what, what to make of this? Um, this, this, this sort of whirlwind tour of... Um, conservation narratives over the last uh, last couple of decades, if not last century. Um, I zoom in on, you know, the idea of protection, so not, not on other things in the global biodiversity framework on neoliberal conservation. I, I and many other colleagues have done that, um, that before. But for me, that, again, I come back to the, to, the, to the central sort of conundrum I, I mentioned in the introduction, like, why does protectionism and the idea of protection um, remain so remain so important in global policy and conservation and you know triggers these kind of neo protectionist uh, waves even though it doesn't in total meet its objectives protectionists and protected areas do you know obviously protect certain species but they haven't stopped the global extinction crisis so what is the trouble with protection that is the central sort of question uh, in in my in my paper. A simplistic way protection in and of itself as i showed before already uh, in relation to the first wave is that cr critics also stated that protection itself is, is, is not a bad thing right uh, even one of the biggest critiques of of, of wilderness bill cronon uh, in his uh, important work on on um, the trouble with wilderness uh, states literally that it is not the things we label as wilderness that are the problem for non-human nature and large tracts of the natural world do deserve protection, but rather what we ourselves mean when we use that label. And he talks about wilderness. 
So what then is the trouble with protection or new protectionism? One element of the trouble, I argue, is the question of who does the protecting and how, right? So John Hutton, um, uh, um, Bill Adams and James Mudumbedzi wrote in 2005 that the point is not whether there should be biodiversity conservation, but how this is best achieved. It is not about protected areas, but how they are implemented. So this, this, this became one of the key elements. And there's a lot of fighting, of course, going on about who gets to control protected areas, how are they implemented, and who is taken into account. Now, the, the global biodiversity framework also goes into that. And for example, states that traditional territories of indigenous peoples and local communities are equally important as part of, quote, an ecologically representative, well-connected, equitably governed systems of protected areas and other effective area-based And why, uh, uh, why we should have protected areas, whether we should have protection, and what is what are the sort of deeper issues with uh, protectionism behind? So this this for me is is, is 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 for me the core, and I come back to what I stated before, right? So I, I said there was a double connotation to protection when you look at the historical literature, a sort of straightforward connotation and this connotation of being restrictive, right? And that gives the term a deep sort of ambiguity, right? It's, it's more straightforward connotation actually connects it to love for caring for non-human nature in a way that we, I think, can all relate to, that we want to protect what we love, especially when those things are under threat. So for me, the trouble with protection is really these two elements combined how a deep connection to or love for nature by many conservationists, right? A love for nature under threat often leads to an urge to protect with a focus on how, who, right? So it doesn't move away from protection, right? Protection becomes the logical sort of step in terms of, yeah, many different peoples, particularly, you know, conservationists who spend, you know, would like to spend time in, in wild nature um feel that when that nature comes under threat it needs to be uh, protected and that is a very deep sort of um element within conservation and the research that supports it in particularly conservation biology uh, etc so this is for me the key element that many critiques have missed the institutional centrality and importance of field research in biology in its and its connection to institutionalized conservation which really is key in both, both uh, neo-protectionist uh, waves. And it creates, and I won't spend much time on that, but it creates what Raymond Williams back in the 60s calls a structure of feeling. Um, a bit of a vague term, but I sort of conceptualized that as sort of a deep yeah, structural culture, way of doing within conservation, that links the political economy of biodiversity destruction with a deeply institutionalized attachment to and love for that same biodiversity within the conservation epistemic uh, community. So let me give you some examples. So what I did, because I, I basically this paper came about because I was so, I was kind of flabbergasted why, you know, 30 by 30 became so prominent in this global biodiversity framework, why protectionism is... So I started rereading the protectionist, um, the neo-protectionist literature. And this is when it sort of sort of hit me that, you know, this relation to, you know, nature, this institutionalized relation to nature through fieldwork is really critically important. And this has a long history, right? Again, uh, Raf de Bond, uh, wrote another, I think, fantastic book called Stations in the Field, a history of place-based animal research, 1870 to 1930, where he talks about a long history of European conservation and argues, quote, while large-scale large -scale capitalism gradually took over the landscape, 
remaining places of picturesque beauty became increasingly accessible for the growing number of tourists. Contemporaries usually perceived all these sweeping changes optimistically as being part of the conquest of nature, but in several milieus, there was also a sense of loss. The latter feeling would, amongst others, fuel the foundation of the first association of nature protection, and naturalists who were stationed in nature itself were obviously close witnesses of the environmental changes mentioned. Often they would use this privileged position to explicitly profile themselves in the debates about how to actually administer nature in an urbanizing world. So this, I think, is, 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 a, is an incredibly interesting quote when you start looking again at this new protectionist literature. So here is John Teborg's uh, uh, famous book, Requiem for Nature, again. And it has three uh, blurbs at the back by uh, Jared Diamond, Catherine Fuller, the then president of the World Wildlife Fund, and, and, and E.O. Wilson, uh, himself, of course, one of the most famous uh, conservationists of uh, a new protectionist uh, slant. And all three of them centrally um, focus on Ter Borg's uh, field credentials. Right? So Jared Diamond calls him one of the world's greatest field biologists. Uh, um, Catherine Fuller talks about his many years of scientific research in Peru's remote Manu National Park and his extensive travels to parks and PAs around the world. And E.O. Wilson says that this is dispatch from the Tropical Conservation Front. Even the, the blurb, uh, the, the central sort of blurb of the book itself, starts with, quote, for ecologist John Terborg, Manu National Park in the rainforest of Peru is second home. He has spent half of each of the past 25 years there conducting research. Over this time, so continues the blurb, he has been witness to the relentless onslaught of civilization. Seeing the steady destruction of irreplaceable habitat has been a startling and disturbing experience. Here's another interesting example. Um, and I will only give a few um, for, for, for time's sake, but this is uh, Thomas uh, Strusaker. Uh, who recently published his book, I Remember Africa, a field biologist's half-century perspective. And he argues, quote, once I began studying rainforest primates, I became acutely aware of how rapidly their populations and forests were being degraded and destroyed due to hunting, logging, and agriculture driven primarily by unsustainable growth in human populations, the population issue, and their ever-increasing needs and wants for material things. My response to this realization was to become more engaged in conservation activities to the point where it seemed I was putting more, at least as much, if not more effort into conservation as I was into research. And then a little bit further in on the same page, uh, 211, he says, quote, in my opinion, anyone who studies and or is interested in wildlife should do what they can to preserve these natural systems. Failing to do so will, of course, increase the chances of losing these systems which we study and enjoy. Now, Strusaker was also the mentor of uh, John Oates, who wrote the other famous book in the first wave of new protectionist literature. So Oates was actually Strusaker's student. And um, similarly in the book argues very personally, that seeing a range of East African parks for myself in the early 1970s strongly persuaded me of the efficacy of what is now sometimes called conventional or exclusionary conservation, the establishment of parks and strict reserves under the management of national government. Furthermore, he argues, the chances, quote, the chances of success in conserving an area seem to be greatly improved if individuals who had a special concern for it were prepared to fight a long battle for its protection. It was apparent that scientists studying rainforests could play an important role in stimulating conservation efforts and that conservation was most effective where a long-term research program existed with resident scientists. And he refers to several, several colleagues around the world who, according to him, had uh, effectively uh, done so. Now, there are more examples that I can mention, mention, but what I want to stress is the sort of institutionalized important, importance of field research in conservation and you know, the, the, the sciences that support it, right? It is, of course, a vital element in biological, ecological research. 
and Lidecker et al. in 2016 noted that there are at least 1,268 biological field stations around the world, permanent stations. So there are actually many more, and you can see them on the map uh, here below. Uh, Morales et al. In, a, in an interesting paper arguing for a broadening, and this comes back to an issue that I will talk about later, the, the very racialized issues, of course, with, with this kind of love for nature. Um, but uh, in response to, to, to a plea to, to diversify conservation more, argues that, quote, for many ecologists and other field-based scientists, field experiences have served as a rite of passage by cementing their identities as ecologists, and we should give more people the chance to, to do that. Now, on the website, how to become a wildlifer, it says another attribute important to employers is hands-on experience. You know, they expect new hires to have field experience with a variety of techniques. So it's wise to acquire as much experience as possible while you are an undergraduate. Now, the, the list goes on and on. Here's just two books, two fairly recent books that really sort of go make the, the relation between research and uh, love for nature and how this is sort of right, very much institutionalized and experienced by many, many graduates who start to work in uh, in biology. So this book, Curious for Nature, a Passion for Fieldwork, has about 50, 55 chapters from conservationists around the world. And um, its preface says that without field studies, biology would be little more than laboratory-based anatomy and physiology for the scientist life in a, in a, life in a white coat. But for me, fieldwork involves much more than this. It gives the sheer pleasure of being outdoors, right? Because same from, from the same book, outdoor learning is for life. People have the greatest respect and care for their world when they have firsthand experience of it. So this is, is a very, again, a very deep, I would argue, what Raymond William calls structure of feeling. And it's also a reason why some in this neoprotectionist literature are actually quite upset. And I didn't quite get this myself because I was, I was, of course, part of these critiques. But the response to that often referred to, you know, these very personal links. And I, 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 I feel I haven't been taking that seriously enough, right? So, for example, Eileen Christ is quite upset that, quote, those who love the natural world and want to protect its freedom, diversity, abundance, and inexhaustible beauty and mystery, as well as our covenant with all this which preceded and once surrounded our very existence are critiqued for promoting a nature human dichotomy and the idea that humans defile or taint the natural world, which would remain pristine in their absence. So in, instead, she emphasizes that those who love the natural world also love human being in general, in more abstract. Ram, you yes? need to be wrapping up now. Sorry, what? You need to be wrapping up. Yes, I'm I'm coming close. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. And so a final um, final example uh, of evidence here it is, of course, that within you know the ecological sciences, you know, one of the most famous you know books by by E. O. Wilson, um, is this idea of biophilia, this idea of of love for nature as being innate uh, in 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 humans. So, how to make how to make sense of that? I, I, so I, I argue that this love for nature is a deep sort of in, deeply part of the institutional structures of both the research supporting conservation and conservation uh, itself. So how to connect that back to the to the discussions uh, above? And I will go a little bit quicker because of of time and and, and Mafa's uh, uh, right uh, rightful prodding. Um, let me let me skip this. My my really main point that I'm sort of currently working through, it's not yet completely, um, uh, 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 it's not yet done, is that um, it leads to a love failure, uh, or ne this neo-protectionist waves lead to a love failure uh, direction, uh, sorry, dialectic, both historical and sort of theoretical. Um, and what I mean with that is that, you know, a focus on protection means that conservation constantly you know, runs behind sort of the destruction of nature. Rob and I have often referred to this as mopping the floor with the taps wide open. 
right? Due to economic growth, our capitalist system, the pressure on our natural environment, on biodiversity, is you know keeps uh, keeps growing, and conservationists have become you know incredibly uh, effective bobbers trying to save what they can here and there. But because ever increasing pressure on biodiversity means more protection is ever needed, right? So. This is not something that is a secret. Neo protectionists know this. That's also why it seems they always try to, you know, they're also part of a much broader sort of community that makes broader alliances, right? So 30 by 30 is not only about protection, it's it's much, much, much more than that. But, and this is the core point, each time that this beyond protection effort does not lead to the hope for, uh, for results, this kind of love failure dialectic kicks in, right? So every time that it doesn't actually lead to a diminishing of the extinction crisis, right? And um, this uh, this embrace beyond protection goes even further, right? To include what the new protectionists have done, all kinds of development mechanisms away from protection. This is when you know many conservationists need to go back to to hardcore protection, and it inspires this new round of neo protectionism. So for me, this is a concrete mechanism to actually explain what Rob uh, Fletcher talks about in his book, Failing Forward, but in specific relation to neoliberal conservation. And I have tried to understand this based on uh, protection. Um, let me maybe conclude there. I mean, there is a lot more to be said around that and uh, that, that I can't, uh, can't do. The only thing that I wanted to sort of add here is... Um, that this historical and cyclical sort of dialectic is not straightforward as all, right? At, at all, it's as ambiguous as protection itself. And this is the final point that leads to the title of the paper uh, of the great conservation tragedy, namely that you know this, these deep-seated connections of care and love for for nature actually lead to a trouble with protection that constantly goes harks back to to protecting something that 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 conservationists love which actually diverts attention away from much more you know difficult debates contradictions issues and particularly forms of power around race gender um uh, uh political economy and capitalism that i believe need to be addressed if we really want to you know make sure that conservation becomes part of a broader movement for a sustainable planet rather than mopping the floors with the taps wide open. I'll leave it there, Mafa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bram. It leaves us very little time for discussion, but I hope that we can uh, engage in Sorry, uh, for that. some kind of uh, conservation conversation. Uh, I'm not going to summarize the the key points, but I, I think I'll, I'll go straight to people who have got questions or comments. I can see some comments, but are there any people with hands up who want to ask questions? I see a comment in the chat. It's about uh, um, the first one is uh, from Neil Mendoza. It says, as any scholars have, as any scholar explored the ambiguity of protecting nature as an empty signifier. I am referring to Ernesto Rocao's model to analyze populism. It sounds as if the idea of protection is a useful signifier uh, that can be instrumentalized to push a colonial agenda, sort, a sort of right-wing protectionist populism. So I don't know whether um, you want to comment on that while we're waiting for some hands. I'll also hand over to, to my colleague Ruth, um, because I have to be somewhere else at two. But uh, maybe Bram, you can you can comment on that while we're waiting for some hands to, to come up or some more uh, comments. Um yeah, I, th I think it's an interesting question. It's empty. So I think I'm actually arguing against the idea that it is an empty signifier. So my my argument is is that it's actually that behind 
this protectionist impulse is a common sense understanding of of a relationship to to more than human natures that I think we have to take very seriously. Um, it's also problematic in many ways, and I, I I wasn't able to spend you know more time on exactly that. Right, one of the key problematic issues, of course, is it's very much sort of based in a sort of a very racialized, white dominated sort of idea of love for nature and the sciences that that have been built on them, which I think is very problematic because then you have to sort of, and I've seen this in my own field work in South Africa where white conservationists literally sort of stated that black people don't have the same, same relationship to nature, um, et cetera. And so it's up to us to 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 protect. And I see Ruth uh, already uh, <laughs> cringing, which I which I did as well. So 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 there are deep seated sort of ambiguities around sort of how racialized uh, this all is. And I think this very rightly led to a major critique around decolonizing conservation. Um, nonetheless how to relate an, an actual sort of connection or attachment to nature, which I think even many here do perhaps have or feel or appreciate, right, to the power structures around conservation, right, which are very racialized, caught up in neoliberalism and, and all that. For me, that that is a, a thing that, that has been sort of under-theorized and that critiques have, have kind, of, kind of missed. So I don't think... So I don't think it's an empty signifier, but exactly what it entails and, and how to understand that on a deeper level in relation to different types of, you know, different uh, ideas about love for nature is, I think, still to be explored. Thank you, Bram. Uh, there's a hand up. Uh, sorry, Ruth, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Mafa, I know you need to leave, so let me just take over. Uh, thank you so much. And Brahma, I'm suggesting actually, given that actually now quite a few people want to say something, let's collect a number of comments and questions. Yes. Let's see if we can get through quite a lot. Um, there's some questions in the chat. Andres Dutroy has his hand up. Andres, would you like to ask, ask your question? Yeah, I, thank you. I'll just quickly, I put my questions in the Q&A box, not in the main chat. I have two questions. Firstly, I, I'm a little bit worried by the very sweeping way in which this supposed dialectic is being framed. I, I don't quite understand why you are conflating the 30 by 30 proposal with neoprotectionism when the proponents of 30 by 30 explicitly argue that the realization of 30 by 30 requires the recognition of the land rights and the knowledge of indigenous people. So I don't quite see why this conflation is taking place. And secondly, why is the narrative that you are developing so focused on the subjective emotional lives of Northern naturalists? I'd, your argument might explain why people based in, 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 in uh, uh, why people based approaches are failing to take hold in uh, European universities, but it doesn't deal with the problem of why people based approaches are failing to take hold on the ground in the global South. And part of the reason seems to me that people-centered approaches have often not delivered on the struggle to deliver on their aims. Um, and uh, the, the answer to why this is, is, that, is at least in part that they're very difficult. The, the question of the how, which you seem to be quite dismissive of in the course of your argument, seems to me to be absolutely central. Um, in the Western Cape, for instance, you'd be quite hard pressed to find a fortress conservationist within the Department of Environmental Affairs in the in the Western Cape Province, everybody agrees that communities should be involved. Yet they aren't. I'm just, wrap up, I'm, I'm just wrapping up. So why does this not happen? It seems to me that the devil lies in the details in how hard it is to make the apparatus of people-centered conservation work. So I focus so much on the feelings of northern writers. Thanks so much, Andres. I'd like to hand on to um, Alexandra Caron, who asked a question, but also I uh, would like to talk to it. Uh, Alexandra? Yes, thank you. Uh, I don't know why I can't start my video, but anyways, you, you can hear me, I guess. Um, yes, yes uh, I think, uh, thank you very much. Very interesting, uh, as usual. Um, 
Well, my first comment is, is uh, about the fact that uh, uh, biological research is, is uh, challenging the notion that nature uh, needs to be uh, uh, protected from humans. Uh, the first one, uh, the first uh, uh, observation is that more and more the nature that we want to protect has been um, uh, engineered by humans for millennium. Uh, we've heard about the leader uh, work on the on the forest in South America, or even savanna ecosystems in in eastern and southern Africa that have been engineered by by by, by people for for ages. So why would we, yeah, would we protect those uh, uh, pristine areas when they have been constructed by humans? And now we know that thirty percent of biodiversity biodiversity is in soil. And we don't have a clue if our network of protected areas is protecting this biodiversity. Maybe it's this biodiversity is high in agro systems or agro biodiverse systems. So these are hard facts that are challenging the the, the the Western the Western dogma or the Western worldview. Uh, and so my question is that uh, so I'm I've been working in uh, Southern Africa by, for 18 years, so it's mainly focused on that on that area of the world. Maybe it's applicable to East Africa. But my feeling is that more and more, I think the conservation uh, world is aware about uh, uh, is aware about the need to change. Uh, the social science uh, uh, literature is known, never cited, uh, almost. Uh, try to be hidden under the carpet, but it's known it's there. Uh, the only thing is that people realize that they need to transform the way they are doing conservation. They have to change everything. And I think that it's uh, it's one of the symptoms of our, of our uh, societies is that we realize for climate change and for many crises that we need to change and to transform the way we do things, but we don't know how to do it. And maybe it's just a replication of that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alexandra. Um, there's somebody else, Alexandra Rasao Manana, uh, who also uh, posed a question in the chat. Alexandra, would you like to say something? Uh, if not, perhaps uh, uh, Bram, you might just focus on that other comment in the in the chat. I'm waiting for another hand. Let's have one or two more hands before we hand back to Bram. Uh, while we're waiting for that hand, perhaps I might just add, um, Bram, it's striking that, of course, uh, uh, the question of protection uh, and protectionism um, is not the only sphere in which policy seems immune to evidence, right? Uh, and so when one's thinking about uh, why this is so resilient as a paradigm and where failure itself um, leads not to the abandonment of a paradigm, but uh, rather a focus on how to make something work. You know, that's where uh, a lot of other examples, whether it be, um, you know, approaches to formalizing land tenure or, you know, integrating smallholders into markets, the, the failures themselves are converted into questions of how to fix a paradigm rather than to abandon it. So it struck me that you didn't really address here the question of sort of powerful interests, financial interests, institutional interests, including in multilateral negotiations. Of course, what could be more topical than right now? We're heading up to COP this week. Um, so I wondered if you might comment on that. Uh, anyone else? I see quite a few people have put their cameras on. Who wants to comment or ask a question? Uh, I think that your, your paper is very much a provocation and we look forward to seeing a final version. Nonetheless, perhaps people have um, either critiques or questions of clarity. Anyone else? Or should we hand back to you? Okay, back to you, Bram. Yes, thanks, Ruth. Um, uh, I mean, maybe starting with, with Andres. Um, uh, just to be sure, I mean, the how is crucial. I, I tried to try to emphasize that. Um, but my argument was a little bit different. And also the intent of the paper perhaps is a little bit different than than what you what you got from it. I really tried to explain why this protectionist thinking is still so dominant in global policy, right? So, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that you referred to, I think, has has been quite effectively written up and there's more work to be done. But there's a lot of research about how how this tra doesn't translate in the global south, et cetera. But in, in conservation, I think uh, the global north, right, in particular, is still very, very dominant, right? 90% of global conservation financing comes from Europe and, and, and North America. 
right? And 90% of that is spent in the global south. Um, so, so, so there are still deep, you know, inequalities, and a lot of maybe this responds to and relates to Ruth Ruth's point as well. That there are, of course, many other elements that come into play, like powerful interests in COP negotiations, um, all that. But in one way or another, I felt that when you sort of look at both the the yeah the global discourse, right, uh, and and the main sort of elements in that and and how certain things get linger on in global policy despite evidence you know exactly again as, as Ruth uh, mentioned there are also other other features at, at at play and I think the the a lot of the basis for this kind of policy and the people that are still involved in this is this sort of institutionalized kind of connection of nature and I mean, Bill Adams wrote to wrote, and I I quote him actually in the in the paper that when you scratch a conservationist, you you get a lifetime. You know, they talk about their love for nature, but you also get a lifetime of hurt as they see this nature retreating over uh, over their lifetimes, and often leads to this focus on protection. And that is my sort of response also to Alexandra. I think, which, and your comment is is absolutely right because a lot of the kind of big conservation and or protected area conservation doesn't necessarily respond to the actual biodiversity that is that is going extinct, right? Most of what is going extinct are species that we don't even know. When I ask in the class here, what species are going extinct? Most, most students don't even know, right? It's, it's, you know, it's not the big charismatic species that still, you know, receive a lot of uh, money, particularly in South Africa, giraffes, uh, all that have been going up right as they as the numbers have declined in the rest of in the rest of africa due to huge capital investments into the wildlife economy and 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 all that so you know using capital to protect species certain species can help but not those species i think alexandra that you mentioned right in in the in the soil or insects or other species that don't attract that don't attract capital and for which this protectionist paradigm is also quite a misnomer so for, for me, that is yet another element why I would say that this continued focus on protection, on increasing protected areas is a tragedy, right? In, in, in global conservation. Why that continues, right, to be a tragedy in, 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 in so many ways, because of the evidence, because of the fact that it doesn't actually protect many of the species that are going extinct, but also because many people behind all of this do have many personal experiences of this connection right over their lifetime that gets translated into these debates and for me that is kind of the situation that we're in the kind of anxiety that many young people also feel about about the planet and and all that and one last comment i do also think it comes out in the social sciences i haven't really sort of put that into into the paper yet but the whole more than human turn in the social sciences for me is exactly kind of part of the same sort of underlying current whereby we need to do justice to our relationships to animals to to focus on animals i and this is a question maybe to to all of you i i don't quite see how that is different so these are different scholars often coming from very different backgrounds but they also emphasize this relationality with the rest of nature that some hardcore conservationists also do, but translate very, very differently in very, very different kind of approaches. But underneath that is a deeper level that is not just about political economic interests, I would argue, <laughs> which is maybe hard coming from me, I because <laughs> I I focus so much exactly on those political economic interests. I can't, I can't hear you, Ruth. Sorry, I'm on team devices. Um, that's a, a strong note on which to leave this. Um, I think that you've given us a lot to think about. Um, perhaps you can give us some sense of when and where you might be publishing this so that people can read the outcome of, of this work. Um, so I, I have finished the first draft of the paper. And if people are, I, I'm not, I, I'm taking my time with this precisely because mm. it's a little bit different and it touches on many sensitive issues. 
that I really yeah. Yeah, want to get right. And so I'm I'm quite keen to discuss this and, and talk to different people about the piece. So if people are interested, I'm very happy to send a draft and 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 yeah, continue the discussions and, and get, get further feedback. I'm I'm not in a hurry with this. Um I, I want to try to get this right. I, I think yeah. the hunch is in the right direction, but it's it, there's a lot of issues that, that are opened up through all of this that I think need to be done justice. So, so I'm, I'm taking my time. Okay. Okay. So perhaps if people want to touch base with Bram, you could uh, contact him directly if you'd like to see a draft. Um, I'd just love to, to add that I would love to hear in your paper some discussion about um, the function of protectionism, not in terms of uh, justifying a paradigm, but in terms of uh, what protectionism absolves and connecting that to the climate change debates on sacrifice zones. Um, yeah. and the special yeah. separation of, of sacrifice zones from climate mitigation sites. So um, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. And thank you, Bram, for a really fascinating and stimulating uh, discussion and uh, such a powerful sort of storyline about an evolution of the debate. Uh, we look forward to your, uh, your published version of this. And please, everybody, if you're interested in this, keep an eye on the PLAS website as well for information about the wider project that this comes out of, which is about living landscapes. Uh, there is a short course coming up in situ in Isimangaliso uh, National Park uh, early next year, uh, led by our colleague Muniba Isaacs. Bram, it's wonderful to have your input. Thank you very much. Everyone, just to say as we wrap up, uh, this is the last uh, PLAS seminar for the year. Thank you, Bram. And we'll be getting going again on Tuesday lunchtimes uh, during uh, early in the, in the new year. So thank you very much. Uh, finally, um, a shameless uh, little uh, punt for uh, an open access book that has just been published. In fact, I think uh, today, uh, which is uh, a collection of papers related to climate change and critical agrarian studies. It came out of uh, the conference we co-hosted last year. It is open access to download, and I'll just paste the link into uh, the chat uh, for anyone who wants to download the book, uh, rather timely. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Bram, so much, and also for offering to make your paper available in draft form for those who are interested. And uh, thanks, everyone, for your participation and comments and questions. Uh, I'm sure that there'll be a lot more around this to be debating. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Ruth. And the, record, the recording will be available on the on the PLAS uh, YouTube channel. So you can check that out or share it with others who weren't able to come today. Thank you. Oops. I'll, stay online. I'll stay online for two more uh, two more minutes. Okay, great. Uh...